Amen. They're pretty good. You know, they say that there are three things that can't be talked about. Religion, sex, and politics. Well, I think they are wrong, whoever they are. The truth is, we talk about those things all the time. The problem is, we do a terrible job at it. So this morning, we're going to talk about all three. No, just kidding, just kidding. (laughs) At least religion. At least religion. Now, honestly, there is one thing that most of us never talk about, and that is death. Death. Oh, we acknowledge it when it happens, but the truth is, we never really talk about death with any meaning or substance. We avoid it. We ignore it. We deny it. None of us wants to die. But here's the kicker. That's exactly what Jesus Christ calls us to do as his followers, to die. If we really want to experience the abundant life, if we really want to experience the joy of being a Christian and have hope and meaning and, and fulfillment in our lives, we have to die. We have to die in order to live. Now, if that seems counterintuitive to you, it is. You're right. Because most of what Jesus taught was counterintuitive, was paradoxical. What did he say? You have to give in order to receive. If you want to be first, you have to be last. If you want to be master, you have to be servant. If you want to find your life, you got to lose it. And all that can really be summed up in one sentence. If you want to have life, you have to die. Now Jesus kind of puts all this in context for us in a passage in John, which is very interesting. This is what he has to say. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, throughout his ministry, Jesus constantly taught that at every turn. If you want to live, you're going to have to die. There's no resurrection without crucifixion. The seed will not grow unless it is buried. And this morning, I'm not just talking about physical death. I'm talking about death at every level, emotional, spiritual, material. I'm talking about giving up those things to God that we think we can't live without. So often in life, we think we can't live without certain things. And Christ is telling us, honestly, you can't truly live with those things. Now, I know all this is not fun to talk about. I know it's not what you want to hear and what I want to hear, what what we want to hear. I get it. We don't want to have to give up anything to gain anything. Most of us really resist loss and death of any kind. I get it. We protest. In fact, Barbara Brown Taylor, that great preacher, talked about the time when she saw a protest of death that she'll never forget. She experienced an Easter vigil at Christ Church in New Haven, Connecticut, Beautiful service, and in that service, a three-year-old named Ellen was to be baptized, which is not, you know, unusual, except Ellen's mother wanted her to be baptized by full immersion, which is kind of tricky in a very liturgical church that only has a bird bath baptismal font. Well, the priest agreed, however, and he came up with this contraption about a 36-gallon garbage can decorated with ivy. It wasn't very pretty, but it suited the purpose. And when the time came for Ellen to be baptized, the priest picked up Ellen and she screamed out, don't do it. She pressed her her feet against that garbage can and, and water sloshed all over the place. Don't do it. Now Taylor cannot remember whether or not Ellen did it. But one thing she will always remember is that child's protest ringing through the rafters of the church, don't do it. Only three years old, but she thought she was about to die and she wanted no part of it. The truth is all of us are Ellen. We don't want any part of it. When God is pushing us away from a certain sin, we cry out, don't do it. When God is pulling us away from our comfort zone so we can grow, don't do it. 
when God tries to lead us away from our past and our resentments, don't do it. Most of us go kicking and screaming into death, into letting those things go. And maybe you're, you're listening this morning, well, I, I didn't want to come to church to hear this kind of message, death in order to live, all this stuff, really. I mean, can't there be a simpler way? Can't there be an easier way, Charlie? Isn't there a, 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 a simpler message? No, there is not. Because one of the things I'm convicted about as I grow as a Christian and grow as a human being is this. We truly have to die if we want to live. To truly give birth to something in our lives, there must be a death. Think about it. An old habit must die in order to give room for a better one, a healthier one. Certain ways of thinking must die in order to get to the desired action. We must leave a place of comfort in order to grow in our lives. That's just the truth. I mean, just listen to newborns as they come out of the womb. What do they do? They cry. Paul cried. I have a nice video of it, you know? They cry. I mean, can you imagine that experience? Most of you probably don't remember that. Oh, how awful that must be to come out of a warm place into this world. Ah! But there's no other way for birth to happen. There's no other way. I mean, just ask a, a recent graduate of high school or college the, what it feels like to have to go away from those places of comfort and actually go out in an age of responsibility and get a job. I mean, that's tough. In fact, a lot of kids still don't do it. I'm going to live in the basement till I'm 50, right? But without that move, without that death, without letting go of that comfort, there is no accomplishment, there is no opportunity, there is no growth. Just ask parents who have to give up aspirations of traveling or these goals or that goals to have a child. It's a big sacrifice, but is there any greater joy than being a parent? We must die in order to live. We have to be broken in order to be made whole. We have to give away in order to receive. Now, J. Wallace Hamilton, some of you know that name, was the great preacher of this church for 40 years, one of my preaching heroes, a great man. And he had a powerful way of illustrating his messages. And he talked about the time when he went to call on a house, call on a family, and when he got there, that the mother of the house well, she was in her onion patch, and she was sitting down in the onion patch, and she was throwing away weeds. And, you know, she talked to him while she was working, and they had a nice little visit. And then Hamilton noticed that along with the weeds, she was throwing away perfectly good onions, small ones, young ones, just throwing them away. And Hamilton looked at her and said, excuse me, why are you throwing away these perfectly good onions? And she said, Reverend, you're not a gardener, are you? Have you ever gardened? There are too many onions in this patch. I have to throw away some of them to give the rest a room to grow. If I didn't, if I let them all stay here, they would all grow up to be these spinely young things that would not be healthy or robust. And reflecting on that, Hamilton would say, sometimes our divine gardener must do the same thing to us. There are desires in our hearts, conflicting desires, competing desires. Some desires not very healthy, and sometimes the divine gardener must come in and pluck those out so they can die to leave room for growth. Now, I see this lived out a lot in our rose garden. How many of you have ever been to our beautiful rose garden? We have great volunteers like Terry who goes in there and they're beautiful, aren't they? But you know what? There's one big thing that has to be done in order for them to be beautiful. What is it? They have to be pruned. Living pieces of those plant must die in order for the rose to be beautiful. And the same is true of us. 
Whether we like it or not, whether we want to admit it or not, whether we want to face it or not, there are pieces of us that must die in order for us to be beautiful for God. Now, honestly, uh, you know, as a, a personal example, I, I can tell you this about my own life and having Paul. Now, I may talk about Paul a little too much, but get over it. He's my child, and I'm proud of him, all right? <laughs> but honestly, I've learned so much by having this kid. I've grown so much. You know, before I had Paul, you know, when Brandon and I had accepted the fact that we were, gonna, were not going to have children, people would often ask me, well, do you have children? That's not a fun question. And so finally, I was just so tired of it. I'd say, no, instead I have a single-digit handicap in golf. Because <laughs> most single-digit handicappers, they're either never home, they're not very good fathers, or they don't have kids, right? Most of them. If you're one that has a scratch golfer and you're a perfect dad, I want to shake your hand and talk to you. You're an amazing person, all right? And I would think about that. You know, if I had a kid, I, I couldn't be really good at golf. I couldn't play all, all this golf on my day off. And, and if I had a kid, Brandon and I just couldn't live and go traveling. And if, and if I had a kid, there, you know, I, I couldn't do all these things. And I would justify all these things in my mind. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. This is great. But oh, my gosh. All those aspirations had to die in order to leave room for the joy of Paul. And I will tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. I wouldn't trade anything for the joy of having this child. Those things had to die in order to leave room for it, you know. And, and, and before I had Paul, you know, I used to go to restaurants and you'd see these parents and they're picking up stuff for the kids and the kids are making a mess of everything and they're throwing stuff. I'm like, gosh, those poor parents, you know. <laughs> and I'd feel sorry for them. But the other day, Brandon and I were, you know, first watched this breakfast place and there I was, I was doing it. Picking it up, throwing it down, picking him up, throwing it down, picking him up. Paul, don't do this. Don't reach for that. No, that's the salt. No, you can't do this. But you know what? I was having so much fun. And that's what I didn't see in those parents earlier. But certain things in my life had to die in order to leave room for that. And there are other examples. I could go on for hours about things in my life that have had to die in order for me to be the person God wants me to be. I mean, early on in my ministry, and I don't know if you can relate to this, but I used to be in the comparison trap. Ever compared yourself to another person? If you don't raise your hand, you're all lying, all right? And early on in my ministry, I used to do that. You know, I used to compare myself to other pastors or preachers. And, oh, I got to be like that. And if I'm not like that, I'm just, I'm not worthy. I'm not a real person. I'm not a real pastor. Or I got to be like that. I gotta, and I got to be like that. And as I've grown, I realize all that stuff has to die. If I want to be me, the person God has called me to be, and be at peace with who I am, as a human being, as a preacher, as a Christian, all those comparisons have to die. So what needs to die in your life in order for you to live? I know there's something. God cannot get started with you unless it dies. I mean, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans, take a look. He says, how can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, look at this, we too may live a new life for if we've been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. And here's one of the truths I want you to get this morning. Each death hides a resurrection. 
know that. If you're afraid of letting those things die in your life and, and you're terrified of it, just know this, and each death hides a resurrection. Christ promised that. And lately I've experienced that through a person I've worked with for years, close with this person. She's battled alcoholism for a long, long time. You know, and a couple years ago she was arrested um, for a DUI. Hit rock bottom. That whole experience, the money it cost. The toll on her, the toll on her family, it it was brutal. But it was a death. And at that moment, she started making decisions. She started letting go of certain things, letting certain things die. And for the last couple years, amazing things have occurred in her life. Things have come together. And she sent me a text recently that says this, it's weird. I feel like things are just falling into place since I broke and started putting my life in God's hands. It's like the beautiful puzzle is just snapping together. Random pieces are just falling into place. I know it's cheesy, but that's how it feels. And I responded, that's awesome. Isn't it amazing when we surrender what happens? Jesus said, those who lose their life will find it. And she said, did Jesus say that? He did, and by his very life and example, we see it. I mean, can you imagine the the death that needed to occur in Jesus' life, what he needed to give up in order to go to the cross? I mean, he was human as well as divine, I'm sure he had aspirations of having a family, of having children, of living a long, prosperous life, of doing great things, but he gave all of that up. And I will say to you, his true death didn't happen with his last breath on the cross. His true death happened when he said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And because he was willing to die in that way, to give it up, He was resurrected. He lived. And by going through that, he says to us, don't be afraid. No matter what death you're facing in your life, do not be afraid because there is a resurrection. There will be a resurrection, I promise. And I want you to listen to me closely because maybe if if you're confused this morning about what it means to be a Christian, if you're confused this morning about what it means to really die in all this death business, I'm about to explain it to you in crystal clear terms. We find the answer to all that in crystal clear terms through a verse that's tucked in the book of Galatians. Take a look. Paul says this. I love this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but what? What? Christ lives in me. Now there are four words I want you to focus on in that verse. I want you to underscore them in your mind. Christ lives in me. Can you say that? Christ lives in me. Now let's break down the word Christian. Maybe you've never seen this before. But Christian is really two words. Christ in Christ in Christian. You see, church, the first discovery that you need to make is that you cannot be a Christian. You alone can't follow Christ. Christ must live in you. That's why we have to die. Because being a Christian and following Christ means Christ lives in us. Christ gave his life for us so we could live his life in us. So here's the truth. You want to know what it means to be a Christian? In one clear sentence, what it means to follow Christ. The Christian life is not you living for Jesus. It's Jesus living in you.
That's why you have to die. We're not following some historical figure. We're not following some kind of philosophy. We're not following some kind of ideal. We, we are following a person who lives and breathes in each of us. Otherwise, this is just entertainment. This is just a motivational speech. Christ lives in us. I have a, a colleague who has a surgeon in his church, real good surgeon, and he has two precious children, a boy and a girl, and he talks about the time when the surgeon was called out to do emergency surgery, and when he got back, his son said, hey, dad, dad, so you had to do surgery, right? Yes, son. Did, did you cut him open, and could you see all the things inside? Yes, son. Could you see his lungs? Could you see his stomach? Could you see his heart? Yeah, sweetheart. And then his four-year-old daughter chimed in because she heard this conversation. She said, oh, daddy, daddy, did you really see his heart? Yeah. Did you see Jesus there? That's cute and funny, but it reveals the greatest truth. That's what it means to be a Christian. Our old version of ourselves dies. And Christ begins to live in us and the world can see Jesus living in us. So what do you have to give up? What has to die in your life in order for Christ to live in you? Sin, ego, Pride, resentment. As some of you know, this time of year, the cabinet and the bishop of our conference get together and they, they make appointments, right? Some pastors stay, some pastors go, you know, they reappoint, announcements are made and all that stuff. And recently, I got a call from a friend of mine who's a minister complaining about his appointment. He called and said, I don't deserve this. I'm better than this church. I deserve a better church. I deserve a bigger church. And I listened and I listened and finally I had enough. And I'm pretty close to this guy, so I just spoke the truth. I said, you know what? You're not going to accomplish anything with that attitude. And then I said, haven't you heard? It's not about you. It's about Christ living in you. Well, he wasn't clapping, all right? <laughs> he didn't like that very much. And then I said, I remember something, uh, you know, I read or heard, and I, and I said, you know what? The, the world is a better place because Michelangelo didn't say, I don't do ceilings. <laughs> and it's true. You look at the great you know, figures in history, religious figures, biblical figures, they all did great things because they let certain things die in their lives. Their ego, their pride, their selfish ambition, their, their ways of thinking about there's only one way. No. The world's a better place because Martin Luther didn't say, I don't do doors. Read your church history, you'll get that one. The world is a better place because John Wesley didn't say, I don't preach in open fields. The world's a better place because Moses didn't say, I don't do rivers, I'm sorry. Noah didn't say, I don't do arcs. The prophet Amos didn't say, well, I don't do speeches. Ruth didn't say, well, I don't do mothers-in-law, all right? David didn't say, I don't do giants. Mary didn't say, I don't do virgin births, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mary Magdalene didn't say, I don't do feet, no way. Peter didn't say, I don't do Gentiles. Paul didn't say, I don't do letters. 
And Jesus didn't say, I don't do crosses. It's only by breaking that you're made whole. It's only by dying that you can live. It's time to die. Your life is waiting. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, get us back in touch with, with what it truly means to be your follower. That it's not about trying to follow rules or trying real hard to be good. But it's about allowing you to live in us. It is no longer we who live, but Lord, you who live in us, as Paul said. And so, Lord, we give to you those things that need to die. We hand them over to you. We throw them out. And we make room for you, all of you, and your spirit and your power. Oh, Lord, come live in us. Come breathe in us. Come empower us. Help us to live out your love in this world. It's in Christ's name we pray.